Eh, estoy muy agradecido al equipo de la Escuela de Periodismo de CUNY, eh, a mi amiga Graciela Mochowski, que nos conocemos de hace muchos años y de otras latitudes, cuando todavía estábamos basados en América Latina y hacíamos periodismo allá. Eh, bueno, como algunos de ustedes saben, yo soy el editor de opinión del New York Times en español, eh, una iniciativa que se creó hace poco más de dos años el New York Times en español, parte de un gran esfuerzo del New York Times por buscar nuevos eh, públicos a escala global. ¿no? Hay una operación que ya lleva un tiempo en China, se han abierto eh, medios nuevos en eh, Canadá, en Australia, hay operaciones nuevas también en, en el Reino Unido. Y Español ha sido una, digamos, de los eh, pet projects de, del New York Times Global. Eh, y tenemos, hoy mismo tenemos una redacción en México que sirve a América Latina y yo estoy basado en Nueva York, en el Departamento de Opinión, porque cuando me contrataron, hablando de cambios internos del, del periódico, todavía está muy vigente la visión de que había un muro que divide opinión de la redacción del newsroom. O sea, el, el newsroom está muy lejos de opinión todavía. ¿no? Pero yo soy, digamos, una, un electrón flotante, porque voy de México a Nueva York eh, con mucha fluidez eh, todo el tiempo. ¿no? En la investigación para, para llegar a, al New York Times en español, para saber qué producto debíamos crear y... y y se, para servir a los lectores en América Latina y en España, o los lectores en español, se determinó que, que, que era necesario eh, crear un producto para un público que es curioso, ¿verdad? que quiere eh, entender problemas complejos del mundo actual y que está en la búsqueda de una información que sea veraz, confiable e independiente, without fear or favor. Eh, y con perspectivas novedosas. Y esto está basado, digamos, en, en el hallazgo de que en toda la región, e incluso en España también, hay una desconfianza eh, bastante marcada hacia los medios principales de esos países. ¿no? Eso debido a situaciones políticas, a la polarización tan grande que ha habido en los últimos eh, 15 años, 20 años en toda la región, y que se ha marcado de manera muy, muy clara aquí, ¿no? Siete minutos, no puede ser. No, no. Bueno, de manera muy rápida, aquí estamos, este es el equipo del New York Times en español hoy, este, yo que tengo un background muy variado y diverso, Patricia Nieto, eh, hasta, hasta diciembre era una operación de solo una persona, pero en diciembre contratamos a Patricia Nieto, que viene de la revista Letras Libres, una revista de pensamiento muy importante en México y que también tiene operaciones en España, y últimamente, hace una semana, incorporamos a Isbeth Verde, estudiante de esta escuela, que nos acompaña y nos va a ayudar a desarrollar muchas cosas que no hemos podido hacer todavía por eh, falta de, 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 de mano de obra y de compromiso. Pero Isbeth está con nosotros. Isbeth es fact checker del New York Times, del Departamento de Opinión, y nos la robamos por un rato por este verano. Ahora, ¿qué era lo más importante cuando, cuando nos decidimos desarrollar la opinión y en general el proyecto del New York Times, era crear un estándar para América Latina que, si bien tiene una tradición de medios muy importante, estaba en medio de esa crisis de credibilidad y necesitábamos más, más despacio. Ok, okay. me están haciendo una señal así. Y necesitábamos llevar una, digamos, dotar de credibilidad a los productos que hacíamos, a las opiniones, a los reportajes que publicábamos, ¿no? Eh, y en el caso de la opinión en particular, no, no, nos basamos en esta premisa de, de Daniel Patrick Moynihan, de que todo el mundo tiene derecho a sus propias opiniones, pero no a sus propios hechos. ¿no? ¿Y eso qué quiere decir? Que bueno, está, esto encapsula la idea de que lo que hacemos en el New York Times eh, eh, y en, en el Departamento de Opinión, tiene que estar basado no solo en una perspectiva o en lo que piensa un autor sobre un tema, sino un argumento que se construye a través de datos verificables. O sea que todo en el artículo está verificado hasta la última, 
hasta, la, hasta el último punto. ¿no? Este, ese estándar lo, yo creo que es algo que nosotros estamos aportando a la opinión en América Latina en este momento. Y, o sea, obviamente ha habido una respuesta muy positiva para todo lo que, lo, lo que hemos hecho, digamos, en tan corto tiempo. ¿no? Nosotros cubrimos temas muy variados, diversos, eh, pero tenemos un foco especial en estos asuntos. ¿no? La democracia, eh, los problemas de género que están muy vigentes. Nosotros tenemos nuestras formas de Me Too, que son no necesariamente las que ocurren aquí, pero en, en América Latina había un movimiento muy grande, ni una menos, que nació en Argentina, se regó a Perú y está hoy en todas partes. Nosotros hemos hecho un cubrimiento muy agresivo de la situación del género en América Latina. Migración, que siempre es un tema caliente y bueno, obviamente relaciones de Estados Unidos, América Latina, porque hay, un, hay un, un nuevo contexto que ha exigido y ha redefinido las relaciones, como ustedes bien saben, y no voy a entrar en detalle. Ciudades, eh, porque también nosotros, y medio ambiente, son temas que no son muy afines y tienen que ver con las líneas editoriales principales del New York Times, y violencia en América Latina, porque como ustedes saben, es uno de nuestros mayores problemas en la región, es la región más violenta del mundo, con los índices de homicidio más grandes que hay, como si fuera una región en guerra, sin tener una guerra. ¿no? Eh, bueno, aquí algunos puntos muy rápidos a destacar. ¿no? En los primeros seis meses publicamos unos 66 artículos, ¿no? en los primeros realmente cuatro meses. Luego, eh, cerca del 25% de nuestros artículos se traducen. Yo creo que eso es un hecho muy importante y pasan al inglés. ¿no? Eh, este año vamos a superar más de 300 artículos, lo que quiere decir una frecuencia de casi uno diario, que es muy alta para un equipo tan pequeño ¿no? de trabajo. Eh, tenemos hoy, esto nos llevó a crear una red de colaboradores que antes no existía y son hoy más de 200 escritores que, que trabajan, digamos, no de una manera regular, pero que han contribuido con nosotros. ¿no? Eh, la resonancia, nuestros artículos, este, bueno, animan la conversación, hay programas de televisión sobre nuestros artículos, mucho debate, mucha discusión, incluso un gran halago para mí, una escritora me escribió anoche diciendo que la habían plagiado casi completamente, entonces hay, hay algo bueno que está pasando dentro, dentro de todo esto. ¿no? Eh, bueno, tenemos hoy un elenco de, de muchísimas eh, eh, personas que contribuyen, que no son solo firmas, sino son especialistas, son protagonistas, son gente que nosotros buscamos, eh, que está ligada a ciertos hechos y buscamos que escriban para nosotros y lo hacen sobre la ocasión. ¿no? Eh, esto es muy importante a mi juicio porque... Hace dos años, cuando yo vine, digamos, el footprint de Latinoamérica, en la opinión del New York Times, era mucho más pequeño. Eso ha tenido una expansión enorme. El año pasado, eh, nosotros publicamos 80 artículos en inglés, digamos, de, que venían de español y se tradujeron en inglés. Eso es un índice muy alto que no tenía... Entonces, se ha abierto, hablando de diversidad, se ha abierto mucho el reporte de opinión a, hacia América Latina, y tenemos autores y temas que son muy importantes y que estamos incorporando de alguna manera a lo que es la visión, esta visión nueva de New York Times, realmente más global, no solo partiendo de lo que es Nueva York, ¿no? porque yo creo que ese es uno de los mayores desafíos que, que tiene el New York Times, si sí, realmente va a convertirse en un medio global. ¿no? Eh, ¿qué, ¿Qué es lo que está pasando ahorita? ¿Dónde estamos hoy? Hemos desarrollado... Eh, esta, esta sección llamada periscopio electoral para cubrir las elecciones, el, el gran ciclo electoral que está viviendo América Latina entre este año y el año próximo, hay cerca de tres elecciones presidenciales y nosotros las hemos cubierto en detalle con las voces más importantes, con los, haciendo perfiles de los candidatos, con políticos de alta envergadura escribiendo para nosotros y muchas cosas más. Acabamos de empezar hoy, Rusia 2018. ¿verdad? Una cobertura muy agresiva con un line-up muy amplio de escritores de, de distintos países que están tanto en Rusia como en otros lugares y van a publicar, esta es una iniciativa conjunta de la redacción y de opinión. Entonces vamos a empezar a publicar a partir de hoy una gran cantidad de artículos hasta que se agote el Mundial. 
Y finalmente, conversaciones con el New York Times. En octubre hicimos nuestra primera conversación con el New York Times sobre el acuerdo de libre comercio entre México y Estados Unidos con Jorge Castañeda y Paul Krugman. La idea es que esto se inicie a través de un ciclo de conferencias nuevo que va a empezar, empezamos, eh, eh, esperamos que se inicie en octubre. Entonces, bueno, hay muchas cosas excitantes pasando. Yo lo que veo en el futuro es la palabra expansión. ¿no? Ojalá que así sea, vamos a hacer más, tener más voces, incorporar innovación, eh, ampliar los recursos que usamos en la página y tratar de ser más diversos, como lo hemos, bueno, incluso más diversos de lo que hemos sido hasta ahora. Entonces, bueno, eso es de manera muy rapidita. Gracias. Podemos tomar dos preguntas. Hola, buenas tardes ya. Eh, mi nombre es Robert Valencia, yo soy eh, editor adjunto de la sección de noticias internacionales de Newsweek. Eh, mi pregunta tiene que ver con eh, cómo hicieron ustedes para poderles, vamos a ponerlo entre comillas, vender la idea a la gente que maneja el, el periódico. Y lo digo porque nosotros hemos... Eh, hemos visto cierta reticencia de algunos editores en publicar materiales en español. Hicimos el primer experimento hace un mes, logramos publicar una entrevista con Vicente Fox en inglés y en español. Pero obviamente hay muchos temas de por medio, que es eh, no genera suficientes clics, tenemos una audiencia anglo, no creo que se interesen en materiales en español, pero yo... Siendo el editor, sigo eh, empujando la idea de que tenemos que diversificar nuestro material. Entonces, la pregunta concreta es, ¿cómo, cómo hicieron ustedes para que ustedes alcanzaran ese, ese respaldo, ese apoyo de sus superiores? Bueno, yo creo que esto es una historia más larga. ¿no? Esto viene de un grupo que se llama 2020, del de, de, de New York Times, que se propuso buscar nuevos mercados. Y esto empezó en 2015, después publicaron un reporte diciendo que de alguna manera el público en Estados Unidos iba a llegar a un, a un, a un techo y que había que pensar en el futuro. El, el comité ejecutivo del New York Times decidió invertir agresivamente en esto y puso una cantidad de dinero para desarrollar nuevas iniciativas. ¿no? Y parte de eso implica las operaciones en, en otros lenguajes, ¿no? como el chino, como el, el español, etc. ¿no? El español ha sido una, una experiencia muy exitosa, puedo decirlo sin sin dar números, porque bueno, ha habido una respuesta muy grande y a diferencia de China, donde hay muros oficiales y censura, nosotros hemos operado dentro de una relativa libertad de expresión. Entonces yo creo que eso es muy importante. Ahora, yo creo que hay que insistir, ¿no? O sea, eh, tanto demográficamente ya sabemos que hay un número de hispanohablantes muy grande en Estados Unidos y regionalmente América Latina es una tierra muy amplia. ¿no? El, el gran truco allí es el modelo de negocios que todo el mundo está buscando, pero bueno, no vamos a entrar ahí porque es un tema realmente muy grande. Yo te diría que insistas y que sigan probando, ¿no? a ver cómo también estos son habituaciones que se van desarrollando en el tiempo, no vas a esperar una respuesta tan rápida que muestre un éxito en, con un solo artículo. Hay que, hay que hacerle conocer al público que está esta oferta y permitirle a ese público habituarse a que va a recibir algo en otra lengua, en el español en este caso. ¿no? Entonces, así yo creo que hay que hacer apuestas de mediano y largo plazo. Cosas un, de, un solo, de, un, de una sola vez no van a funcionar. ¿no? Otra pregunta. Mucho gusto, eh, soy Cristian, también acá con mis colegas de Insider y pues mi pregunta sería sobre eh, los proyectos de compañías igual como el de nosotros en Insider Español y New York Times en Español. Eh, ¿Ustedes distinguen eh, entre eh, la audiencia latina en los Estados Unidos y el resto de Latinoamérica en su estrategia o solamente se enfocan en decir ok, vamos a poner todo en español y los que, los que vengan, que vengan. Así, así mismo es, tú lo definiste. <risa> <risa> ya respondiste la pregunta, los que vengan, que vengan por ahora. ¿no? Todavía no hemos llegado a un grado de sofisticación que nos lleve a enfocarnos en, la, en el público latino en Estados Unidos, aunque quién sabe, ¿no? quizás es una, 
una nueva frontera a explorar. Yo veo esto como fronteras, ¿no? como espacios que, y en, en los cuales la diversidad es un punto crítico para la visión de, del periódico como un medio que no es solo un medio de Nueva York, un medio nacional que es excelente ¿no? o que cubre el mundo de manera excelente para estos públicos, sino que tiene el reto de realmente abrirse a otras cosas. ¿no? Y entonces en ese caso, bueno, también formaría parte de una próxima etapa, buscar la, el público latino dentro de Estados Unidos. Mientras prepara Jessica, no sé si notaron, pero hay uh, name tags, hay unas stickers. Uh, uh, no tuvimos tiempo de imprimir uh, name tags para todos, pero como par buena parte de lo que van a hacer ahora durante el almuerzo es uh, networking, además de comer empanadas. Uh, si quieren, hay ahí uh, name tags, bien, uh, para que escriban su nombre y, de, y su organización, así la gente puede conectarlos. Ok, perfecto. Uh, we're there. Okay, good. Uh, I'm going to switch from English to Spanish with the translator, okay, because I speak faster in Spanish than in English, so it's better. So I'm going to go back and forth, okay, como todo el mundo aquí, okay. Um, as, eh, me gusta siempre preguntar cuando tengo alguna conferencia, prometo ser breve, hablo rápido, sorry. Um, ¿Cuántos de aquí son US born Latinos? Okay, y los demás, immigrant Latinos, right? Okay, so uh, it's interesting, uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, voy a hablar un poco como investigadora, como former journalist, eh, pero también como profesora del, de, nosotros tenemos un Spanish language minor in journalism, no es un master, pero es un en undergrad en California, en Cal State University Northridge, estamos ubicados en Los Ángeles, en el Valle de San Fernando. Entonces yo empecé mis investigaciones analizando los latinos, inmigrantes latinos en España, en realidad. Eh, y así empecé, ¿no? Y luego hice el mapping de, Latino, de los ethnic media, pero en Madrid, en la época en que fue el boom de la inmigración eh, de los latinos en, en, en Europa. Eh, y luego también trabajé temas sobre consumo cultural de los latinos en zonas urbanas y en zonas rurales. Ya en Estados Unidos he trabajado representación de los, medio, de los latinos en, en, los med en mainstream media, también los Latino Media en Global Cities, he hecho trabajo de campo en Nueva York, en Miami, en Los Ángeles, y también he trabajado el tema de las industrias culturales de los latinos en Estados Unidos. Y ahora recientemente con el sabático estuve trabajando el tema de los inmigrantes latinos en Asia, este, me puse a estudiar japonés, fue muy interesante eso, y eh, fui a Japón a hacer entrevistas con inmigrantes latinos, yes, we do have uh, Latino immigrants in, in, in Japan, okay? eh, Entonces, por ahí viene la, la, un poco lo que quiero contarles. Eh, luego he trabajado varias um, varios, eh, publicaciones sobre historia de la prensa en español, de televisión en español. En un último proyecto que hicimos fue un estado, eh, un state of the art de ethnic media in the US, y yo hice el capítulo de los, de los eh, medios latinos. Y una última publicación que tuve fue muy interesante sobre eh, la metodología que yo uso cuando enseño eh, periodismo a inmigrantes bilingües, y el título del capítulo se llama Hashtag Jóvenes Latinos Teaching Civic Advocacy Journalism in Global Context, está de un, dentro de un libro que se llama Civic Engagement in Diverse Latino Communities, Very inter muy interesante, y la editora del libro está, está aquí, por si quieren luego hablar con ella sobre el libro, fue una grata sorpresa verla aquí. Entonces, lo que yo quiero eh, trabajar es, eh, y esto es eh, un capítulo que estoy escribiendo para un libro que estamos terminando de editar, que se llama The Handbook of the Diaspora Media and Culture, que va a ser publicado por IMCR, eh, y donde estamos haciendo un overview de todo lo que eh, tiene que ver con diásporas y medios. Y entonces, una de las reflexiones que yo traigo en ese capítulo es, eh, ¿cómo es que…? No puse play. Ok, now I know my timing. Ok, eh, ¿por qué hay esta tendencia a homogenizar grupos que somos tan diversos, ¿no? De grupos que somos tan heterogéneos, ¿no? Entonces, un poco, si pensamos en US Latinos and Latin American Immigrants, ese sería nuestro primer mm, eh, matrimonio, ¿verdad? Y como dijo Mark, esto es nuestro panorama en los 80, esto es nuestro panorama en los 90, esto es nuestro panorama en los 2000, 
Y esto es nuestro panorama recientemente. Entonces, es bien interesante ver no solamente estos fenómenos de concentración geográfica, sino de dispersión geográfica, y hay que entender la historia de las migraciones latinas en Estados Unidos para entender el contexto de los medios latinos. ¿no? Entonces, eh, si se fijan, para mí es un poco, hace nuestro segundo, eh, nuestro tercer matrimonio, ¿no? US Latinos, Latin American Immigrants y también Latin America pero nos vamos a complicar más porque así somos latinos de complicados. Entonces, así es como nos movemos ahora mismo. Hay más o menos 30 millones de latinos living abroad. Somos un montón. Y, es, y en realidad no nos quedamos quietos. Yo soy peruana, me moví a estudiar la maestría en México, luego me fui a estudiar el doctorado en, en España y ahora eh, eh, vine a Estados Unidos a, a dar las clases en California. Entonces, yo lo veo más o menos como esto, ¿verdad? O sea, somos... Depende, ¿no? Eh, Latin American Immigrants, eh, US Born Latinos, primera generación, segunda generación, contar dentro de la migración nuestras diferentes situaciones, etc. Todos sabemos que este es nuestro panorama porque el Pío nos mantiene informado constantemente. La mayoría somos mexicanos, eh, puertorriqueños, ahora los salvadoreños, han uh, surpassed, ¿no? Los, los cubanos, interesante esto, y bueno, el resto de latinoamericanos que también estamos aquí y estamos en diferentes sitios, ¿no? Una cosa que nos, nos, nos eh, hace en común es el, el tema de ser eh, bilingües y biculturales. Y a mí me gusta incorporar esto de bilingües y biculturales porque nuestro cerebro está conectado, es como yo le digo a mis alumnos, ¿no? I know you've, uh, you've heard that speaking Spanish, you're less because you speak Spanish, is that way around, you're more because you speak Spanish, you're more intelligent, right? Entonces, eso es lo que yo les digo a mis alumnos, ¿verdad? Entonces, por eso es muy interesante tener in front of the students a professor that speaks in, uh, that speak English with an accent. I have a strong accent. Um, we're in the club, the same club, that's right. Okay, y una cosa muy interesante, y estos son los datos de el Cervantes, que a veces coincide, a veces no coincide con el Pew, pero bueno, salvando las distancias, tenemos que tener en cuenta que tenemos entre 40 y 50 millones de hispanohablantes. Muchos de los que estudian español en el término académico no son latinos, son anglosajones. Y esto es bien interesante, ¿quién está estudiando el idioma para qué? Y ese es otro momento en que podemos investigar esto, ¿no? Eh, ya sabemos que por el Pew, eh, la mayor, el, el español es el idioma más hablado, en, en, no inglés más hablado en Estados Unidos, sabemos también que se está perdiendo en números, pero en, en porcentaje, pero no en números, esto es bien interesante, pero esto tiene, está relacionado con, también con todas esas leyes que han tenido una política, um, una willingness, política willingness, ¿no? para no favorecer la educación bilingüe, y esto ha afectado también a las comunidades latinas eh, en muchos estados. Y esta es una parte que yo quisiera, denme dos minutos más, eh, de, 100, de 100 alumnos latinos, 46 entran a high school, de esos 17 van a community college, 26 van a uh, enrolling college, 9 entran a four-year college, 1 goes to four-year college, 8 get a, a master's degree, 2 uh, get a degree, and then less than 1 get a PhD or a grad studies. Tenemos un problema aquí de acceso a la educación muy importante. ¿no? Entonces, en realidad, cuando eh, yo quiero hablar de los... Um, de los medios latinos, lo que siempre empiezo en mis textos, en mis publicaciones, es los medios latinos son diversos porque los latinos somos diversos en Estados Unidos. ¿no? Entonces, tenemos 200 años de periódicos, 90 años de radio, 60 años de televisión, una década más o menos de online, 5 o 6 años de social o millennial media, y dos, dos años de haber una tendencia ¿no? de eh, medios mainstream que se está volviendo al español. Pero también somos muy diversos porque... Depende del ownership, depende del geographical, uh, podemos ser nacionales, locales, hiperlocales y transnacionales, que es la parte que me parece más interesante de analizar, porque es de repente la, la, la menos eh, tocada, ¿no? Depende del idioma en español, inglés, español, del formato, etc. Entonces, volvemos a los medios latinos son diversos porque los latinos somos diversos, ¿no? Entonces, esto es bien interesante pensar... ¿eh? Solo tengo 10 minutos y Graciela ha sido muy estricta conmigo y es una buena estudiante. Entonces, <risa> Entonces eh, es interesante ver los major Spanish markets, pero también hay que ver, ay, perdón, me fui atrás, los, eh, los, los, eh, que son, eh, los que están creciendo. Entonces, esto es bien interesante para entenderlo, porque tiene que ver con nuestros procesos de eh, concentración y dispersión geográfica. Nos estamos moviendo, nos hemos vuelto de inmigrantes a migrantes y nos estamos yendo de Nueva York a Orlando, de Los Ángeles a Colorado, a, estamos yendo a North Dakota, nos estamos yendo, nos estamos moviendo, ¿no? Entonces, por eso es que están empezando a aparecer hyperlocal media, porque en general, y esto pasa en todos los inmigrantes latinos en diferentes, en diferentes países, llegamos, nos juntamos, vivimos en el mismo... En, y me quedo un minuto. 
eh, y tenemos organizaciones de latinos y luego tenemos también nuestros propios medios porque necesitamos informarnos de cuestiones específicas, ¿no? Eh, bueno, voy a pasar, ah, y, bueno, esto lo voy a pasar porque no hay tiempo. Y yo quería terminar tocando el tema de la crisis. ¿Por qué hablo de la crisis? Porque eh, los latinos empezamos a venir como inmigrantes debido a dos crisis que tuvimos en los 80s y los 90. Fue la crisis financiera y económica en Latinoamérica que se convirtió en el latino boom, right? en, en Hispanic Decade en, en Estados Unidos por el mercado. Y luego una crisis, de la, la crisis de la recesión económica hizo que los medios latinos también se resintieran. Entonces vamos de crisis en crisis. Y entonces yo quiero pensar también en las crisis humanitarias y políticas que tenemos. ¿no? Tenemos nuestros, nuestros indocumentados, nuestros DACA recipients, nuestros TPS recipients, nuestros deportados, nuestros refugiados. Tenemos un montón de situaciones que nos afectan a todos, tengamos o no documentación, porque nos afectan a todos, y no solamente aquí, sino también en Latinoamérica. Y entonces yo quiero pensar que, no, no lo quiero llamar journalism crisis, sino challenges, ¿verdad? Hemos pasado por las diferentes revisiones tecnológicas, el internet, el social media, eh, la, la, los challenges que hay económicamente, el ir por, por el profit, eh, las, la, eh, los newsrooms están shrinking, este, sabemos ahora de todos los layoffs que han habido, ¿verdad? Y el tema del funding, el problema que tenemos es el funding con public and community media el language, el medio y el multimedia. ¿Cómo hacemos esto nosotros entonces en las escuelas? ¿Cómo educamos a, a, para que estos alumnos entren a estos medios que son tan diversos, tan complicados, tan challenging, etcétera, etcétera? Y ahora no solamente hay que decirle que las esdrújulas se, se acentúan, porque todas las esdrújulas se acentúan, sino que hay que enseñarles a hacer fotos, radio, podcast, website, data, journalism, etcétera, ¿no? Entonces, yo que fui periodista print, fui periodista de magazine, de radio, de televisión, But I'm teaching everything all together, right? It's very interesting. Entonces, lo que hacemos es básicamente centrarnos en un par de líneas y una es enseñar civic advocacy journalism. Los medios hispanos son necesarios en español porque tenemos una tendencia a cubrir los, los temas que nos interesan a nuestras comunidades. Y el mainstream media no está haciendo eh, esto en, en, la, en la medida que lo debería hacer. ¿no? Y entonces incorporamos una mm, perspectiva de metodología que es más critical, um, critical pedagogy in teaching journalism to bilingual and cultural uh, college students. Eso es lo que estamos haciendo en California. Y les enseñamos principles of civic advocacy journalism, communication for social change, y la Liberatory Pedagogies, Community Engagements and Service Learning. <laughs> ok, ok. Gracias, Jessica, por tu presentación. Tienes tanta información. Quiero saber, are you going to make your slides available? so that we could <laughs> refer to them well, in the future. I would love to get Most of the things that I have PDF. just talked about are in my publications. So if you Google my name, all everything is all together. I already published everything. Yeah, but, but everything is yeah, located course. right here. Of so course. <laughs> this, is, this is the basis of my um, book chapter, the one that is, uh, the title is going to be Homogenizing Heterogeneity. Uh, and it's going to be in the book, hand, the Handbook of the Diaspora Media and Culture, eh, que se va a publicar eh, próximamente. Okay. Hola, eh, soy Igor Moreno de Democracy Now! en español. Eh, a mí me gustaría saber si tiene algún tipo de datos sobre el consumo de medios que hacen los latinos en zonas como Asia, por ejemplo, en zonas con culturas e idiomas muy diferentes, o el norte de Europa, ese tipo de, de, sí, de sí, áreas. Sí, sí, estoy, estoy trabajando en la publicación de, de eso también, porque es muy interesante. En, en Japón la mayoría de los inmigrantes latinos son eh, brasileños, brasileños y, y peruanos. No sé si tengo peruanos en la sala, pero somos brasileños y peruanos, pues yo soy peruana. Eh, y sí, hay un, hay un por, eso, por eso hablaba del de transnational media, ¿no? los medios eh, latinos se convierten en traductores no solamente del idioma, pero traductores de la cultura. Y en países como Japón, Japón es sumamente importante. Muchas gracias. Uh, me llamo Monique, soy brasileña también. <ríe> Estudio el máster en periodismo en Canadá. Y bueno, a veces hablas de latinos, a veces hablas de, de hispanohablantes. Y mi pregunta es si en tus estudios de representación eh, de mainstream media aquí en, en Estados Unidos, si consideras también los brasileños o si son 
solo más vueltos a los hispanohablantes. Esto es bien interesante. Te contesto sí. con el caso de Londres, por ejemplo, porque hago investigación eh, en, en, en Londres. Eh, ahí han formado la comunidad luso hispano parlante para incorporar a los brasileños. Eh, pero si yo, ¿tú te sientes latina? Pues yo te siento latina. Esa es la idea. Hay mucha gente que, bueno, que ve a los brasileños y los considera como latinos. Hay un poco una confusión así. Entre, no falo portugués. Sí. Ah, bueno. Yo entiendo ya. lo que usted está hablando. Entonces, estamos, estamos, lo que quiero decir es que nos, eh, nos podemos entender, ustedes nos pueden entender. Si, si, nosotros, si yo hablo español despacio, tú me entiendes. Si tú hablas al señor despacio, yo te entiendo. Ahí está nuestro punto de conexión. ¿Viste el diagrama de Baum? Yo quiero hablar siempre de semejanzas, no tanto de diferencias, pero uh, embracing our diversity. Does that make sense? Sí. Muchas gracias. Uh, la idea, estas lightning talks son lightning talks uh, for a reason, but so uh, the, la, the, el modo en que lo pensamos a estas lightning talks es que sean como comienzos de la conversación que pueden tener luego con Jessica en uh, over brunch o uh, en el almuerzo o en el coffee break, o en la recepción, en el, la, en el cóctel que tenemos hoy a la noche. Eh, por favor, quédense, hay una comida y tragos cuando termina la sesión. Entonces, si tienen preguntas que no han podido hacer, les, les pedimos disculpas, pero van a tener la oportunidad de hacerlas directamente y de conectar con los speakers a lo largo del día o de los dos días. Perdón a la traductora, que hablé demasiado rápido. Tengo mi timer aquí, listo, para que no me regañen. <laughs> um, so, thank you for having me here. Um, it's been a hey, long time. Excuse me. Yes. Are you Carolina Guerrero from Radio Ambulante? Uh, yes, I am. How do you know it's me? I'm a huge fan. Oh, great. Uh, so, what's your favorite Radio Ambulante story? Oh, actually, no, I don't speak any Spanish, oh. like none. Mm -hmm. But I think you guys are just amazing. I love what you do. Oh, wow, that's uh, very interesting. Thank you. I'm actually in the middle of something here, uh, so I got to go. But um, um, hopefully, like, I, I can give you something later. Uh, so I'm such a bad actor. <laughs> but I wanted to try that. Uh, okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, uh, so, okay, I was saying, I'm sorry about that, that was very weird, um, but believe me, we get that a lot, and uh, we also get this. Um, Radio Ambulante is so good, no good for a Spanish language podcast, great podcast without qualification. Probably in my top two shows of all time in English or Spanish. Every story is so good, I feel bad for people who can't listen to Spanish. And I, I also feel bad. <laughs> so for, uh, if you don't know what Radio Ambulante is, we are a Spanish language podcast telling uniquely Latin American stories. Um, we created Radio Ambulante in the US. Um, um, and our elevator pitch uh, when we started Radio Ambulante was six years ago. Uh, this is like uh, this American life, but in Spanish and transnational. So that worked. Um, of course, now we refer to this American life as like Radio Ambulante, but in English. And I heard that Ira Glass is also using that sometimes. Um, so the thing is this. We have a catalog of more than 100 episodes produced Um, that are from, from more of 20 countries, including the United States, that we consider a Latin American country. And um, we know that this content is extraordinary, and we're super proud of it. Some listeners here probably can uh, really um, confirm that. But there is also, um, it has been hard to prove the case of Radio Ambulante because it's a Spanish language podcast, no? And probably it's not just this media company that Uh, navigates that duality. Probably many of you here as Latinos understand what I'm talking about. 
Um, so we want this, uh, we always ask ourselves, how can we make these important and unique stories to cross borders? And I'm gonna talk about it. Uh, but first, I'm gonna just give you a little background about Radio Ambulante. Uh, so we launched the project in 2012. Um, uh, we had to teach ourselves to produce long form radio. We didn't know it was that complicated because we didn't know anything about radio. So we worked a year before, raised some money on Kickstarter and produced uh, proudly three episodes that year. And we're very, very proud also of the 7,000 listeners that we got because that's a bunch of people. But of course, in the ecosystem of uh, digital radio, that's nothing. Um, but then we have been growing steadily um, and we started understanding the industry a bit. Um, we, um, I think you see a spike here. On uh, these are number of episodes produced per year, and these are number of um, listeners or downloads. So there was a spike here because we uh, very quick tried to validate our content in the United States by creating partnerships. So we were partnering with shows like Radio Lab, This American Life. Our stories were featured on the New York Times Magazine, and, and we started like like. I mean, what is impressive about this is that we didn't grow and, and, and stole somebody's audience. We built this ad, uh, audience from listener number one. We were those listeners. So very quick, just to, to pass this, because this is not the, the reason of my talk. Um, um, so the highlight here is that in 2016, we joined NPR as the first Spanish language podcast uh, in the United States that helped us build a more sustainable um, non-profit business model. Uh, and also like gave a, a seal of validation to the content that we produce. With that in mind, we have been improving our workflow um, a lot and we were able to move to a weekly frequency. Um, and, and that has like really paid off with like numbers of downloads. Um, so we created Radio Ambulante on the premises. If I'm, it's too fast, you tell me because I speak too fast. That's why I, I chose English because I'm slower in English. So um, we created Radio Ambulante on the premises that, that a well-told story is universal and crosses borders. And we, like, because we were Latinos in the U.S. and couldn't see ref ourselves reflected on the media and couldn't find the quality of the content that we wanted and we were forced to consume media in English, we knew that we could bring something that was regional, that could, could transcend um, the, uh, like this. So... Um, we started, but so, so we produced this catalog and it was always monetization has been an issue. And um, so, so we, I'm sorry, I I'm, I'm lost my idea, but monetization has been an issue. And only last year after like becoming part of NPR and, and getting a grant from a Carter Foundation, we were able to hire an engagement editor whose job is to take a look on the metrics and really be the advocate of the audience. We communicate with the audience because what we're missing for us was like knowing what they think and also like broadening and really building this regional conversation around uh, themes and subjects that are important for Latin America and for Latinos. So I'm gonna tell you about what we're doing to build that conversation. So every Tuesday, um, there is a new episode of Radio Ambulante, which is Happy Tuesday for everyone. You can find the episode on, on different po podcast apps, on uh, Radio Ambulante and NPR's websites. We use social, uh, social media and the newsletter to announce the episode and do cross-promotion cross on NPR shows. What was new is that we created this, this new channel of distribution, WhatsApp, and the way we are using this is like we let the, the the listener know on their phone, not as a group, on a personal message, that there is a new episode. It's important in WhatsApp to have the right tone and not be spammy. But usually, like we have discovered with this, that people love to get this personal connection with Radio Ambulante, and they love to interact. Mostly they, they say, oh, thank you, this is so great. Oh, I listened to the episode. So with that in mind, we realized that we could also incorporate these people to our production and our stories. And because WhatsApp has a great voice memo recording that probably you use as well, as well we have been asking people to, to, to participate. So for example, this is a, a screenshot of a listener sending their uh, personal experience of uh, Peru getting into a workup. Um, 
We are also, uh, do, we created another space, it's, it's very frugal. What we're doing with this, that we consider is very innovative, is use spaces that are common for the listeners. And of course, we still are underfunded, so it's like this is the, pe the best place. So we went to Facebook and created the Club de Podcast Radio Ambulante. And the Club de Podcast Radio Ambulante, Jorge Caraballo, our wonderful uh, engagement editor, um, asks questions about the episode, talks about it, and moderates a conversation that is um, that tries to be engagement, and we have seen beautiful things going on. So we have, like, for example, like questions about a story. Uh, do you have a family member? And people really opens up. People people want to to talk about it and to tell us more. And they, it has become like a bar where everybody knows each other. You know, like so. So this is beautiful. And you have people from the Bronx talking to somebody in Chile, from somebody with somebody in Puerto Rico, with somebody in Europe. Um, so we are creating those spaces in a different way as well, uh, like as a survey, we give spaces for like aspiring radio producers to ask questions uh, and all our team come to answers. We also give spaces to people to share what they're doing, what, what they want to share, like their own podcast, their own media project, what they're reading, etc. Fridays we have Facebook, we host uh, Facebook, Facebook Live with producers of stories and editors and give the opportunity to our community of listeners to ask questions and participate. And also for like a tone, like a doses of uh, delightful, we also create them thematic playlists based on the themes of the of the of the episode. These are crowdsourced uh, playlists, very recommended. Stop everything and go and register because these are like really like imagine a continent recommending songs, no? So that's very eclectic and interesting. And the last thing that we did, like that, I'm going to talk about is that we used to have this boring newsletter. Every Tuesday, I think it was the most boring, really, newsletter, and we did realize that that was nothing, no? Like, people were not unsubscribing because they are very generous. But then, <laughs> in the, during the weekend, um, we created this version for the weekend that is para el fin de semana. It's like a newsletter de recomendados. So we are, um, members of our team are recommending things, an app, a, a, a song, uh, a, a documentary, anything, and people are appreciating. I mean, our followers are appreciating, and we have grown a lot on the, on the, on the subscription. Um, also, we featured the, the uh, listener of the week. Um, talk about different words in Latin America that we all know from the country of origin, and also uh, a gift for delightful. Just some of the stories of Radio Ambulante sometimes are a bit dark, and people like really ask us about it. So we bring like try to bring every moment of delightful. Uh, to to you, so um, okay. So this has been like really working. So this is we never stop working. So but since we hired Jorge, you can see from 2017 and 2018 how how we are duplicating the number of of downloads. And also like we have been growing steadily. But I'm not gonna stop there because it's um, it's gonna take more time. But you can read that. Um, I think. This is the thing, to, to conclude, um, I just want to close with this. So we created Radio Ambulante because we really couldn't find that option for us as Latinos in the US. We knew that with this common language that we shared, that is Espanol, we could also like talk to Latinos. And early in the project, uh, we learned that we had so many uh, English learners and Latin American enthusiasts. But we, and I used to refer to this as, a, as our three audiences, but with Jorge and the words that he's doing, we're doing like what we have to do, that is that we have just one continent. And I think this is amazing. And Wow, that was amazing. Oh. <laughs> Too bad I don't speak Spanish. Oh, actually, uh, thank you for bringing it. I'm, I'm gonna, I have something for you as well. So, in case that you are in the audience and you don't speak Spanish, but you really, really wanted to understand Radio Ambulante because everybody talk about it, this fall we're going to launch an app. Uh, the app is, is going to be, that's requiring a lot of technology. So, this is going to train your ear um, to help you understand Radio Ambulante. I have to clarify this. Each episode of Radio Ambulante is seriously long. It's between half an hour and an hour. So, and it's the complexity of the stories is really like not for basic Spanish, but we're working hard to create an engaging and platform that requires work. But our developers are calculating that in a couple of months, after like working, you will be able to, to understand. And uh, finally, I have to say this, hopefully, uh, this will be cheaper than some t-shirts that I saw here. Uh, it, this will help us to sustain our amazing journalism. And I have a demo on my phone. If somebody wants to see more, just let me know. We're looking also for like, 
uh, partner some funding for that. Okay, thank you. Eh, ok, who has a question? Yes. Carolina, te voy a preguntar en español. Buenas tardes. Eh, Yo hablo mejor español. <risa> Estamos de acuerdo. Oh, mucho gusto, primero que todo, y muchas gracias por estar aquí. Oh, mi pregunta es, primero que todo, felicitaciones por el podcast. Totalmente maravilloso, este, totalmente enamorado. Oh, y la pregunta va, ¿cómo descubrieron WhatsApp? Es una plataforma muy poderosa en Sudamérica. En los Estados Unidos se utiliza, pero es mucho entre la comunidad latina más que todo y el impacto que ha tenido, porque en Sudamérica es como que la plataforma principal de comunicación. ¿Cómo llegaron a eso? Muchas gracias. Sí, el año pasado yo estaba en una conferencia, voy a contestar en español, uh, o like, uh, because if you don't have translate, okay, so how we, did we discover WhatsApp? So last year I was in Colombia at a conference and I heard this Politico, this editor at Politico answering this question. Do you use WhatsApp? And he was like, no, in the United States that's not a common platform. And I was like, well, maybe if you have an immigrant in your family or like everybody who's an immigrant uses WhatsApp. And then with Jorge we were talking about it and he was very curious about how to use WhatsApp. Um, there is a project that I recommend, it's called Outlier Media. Uh, Sara Alvarez from Detroit is reporting using WhatsApp. And I think the thing with Latinos is that we are very oral. We like to talk and talk and get into meetings and talk um, and record messages. And um, So WhatsApp is a, is a platform that you have to understand how to use. We ask people to subscribe and we let them know what is going to happen. And I think with Jorge has been wonderful at finding the right tone and voice. And, and also like one important thing for, one clue for any entrepreneur here, what works, what is great here is that it's so direct and if people appreciate what you do, they, those are your first and early testers for everything. They will just be like, you ask for a field this survey and they will just prune. The 1,200 of them will just participate. Any other question? I have one. So, uh, we've, uh, hemos hablado de esto, pero para el público. ¿Cómo, uh, el modo en que yo escucho mis podcasts es, le digo, Alexa, please, play Radio Ambulante. And she's like, I'm having trouble understanding you. Yeah. Alexa, play Radio Ambulante. I'm having trouble understanding you. So, yeah. how um, can we fix that? I, I mean, first, uh, I think we need to tell, I, I'm going to record myself, Radio Ambulante, Radio Ambulante, Radio Ambulante, and send them to Alexa. But what we're doing is that I think the partnership with NPR, um, we ask NPR, no? Like, uh, how can we really, like, train Alexa's ear also? And uh, if she doesn't have an app as this one, uh, to really understand Radio Ambulante. I had, like, a, we have tried native speakers, my, my kids. Uh, we, I, ha I made a video of my kid training, and that has been really a challenge. I think the, uh, what we need is because this is AI, we need to just go to them and it seems that NPR is helping us to work on that, to just create different accents to, to, so she can learn that uh, and diversify a bit. But I, I think that's a real challenge. It's, it's, it's funny, but it's a real challenge for uh, accents in the US that I, I hope that at some point these companies that do so much innovation include in their uh, strategy. I think that's it. Thank you so much. All right, sit down. <laughs> It's all right. No, you, you never lose them. All right, people. Yeah, Latinos, por favor, siéntense. That was your, okay, that, that was supposed to be a stretch, not a stretch to talk. All right, everybody back down over here. Amiguitas, over here. Okay, it was supposed to be a stretch, not a stretch for conversation. <laughs> anyway, you guys, are we ready? Yes. Over here, I'm waiting for the ladies on the right over here. I'm Rebecca Aguilar. Find me on Facebook, Twitter. Um, my whole career, 37 years this month, I have heard excuses. 
no puedo encontrar una Latina con experiencia. Oh, really? Yeah, I can't find a Latina with experience. No puedo encontrar un productor con experiencia Latino. I can't find a producer Latino, bilingüe, bilingual. Oh, really? I've been a member of NHJ since 1986. I have been hearing excuses my whole career. My whole career. I've also heard, oh wow, this is the year of the Latino, el año de los Latinos, really. I heard that in 1990. I heard it in 2000. I heard it in 2015. Oh, what else have I heard? Oh, that word that makes non-Latinos feel warm and fuzzy, diversity. Oh, okay, and, and first of all, let me just put transparency, I'm married to a white guy, so. So I've heard that word, oh yeah, we want diversity. Ooh, it feels warm and fuzzy. Gosh, we love you Latinos. We love you African Americans and Native Americans and the rest of the people. But where is it? We are in 2018. Listen to this. And Charo, I am so glad you brought up those statistics because I'm not gonna give you a lot of numbers, but here's the other reality. And no disrespect to people who work at CBS News, but CBS 60 Minutes is celebrating 50 years. And guess what? No Latino has ever been on 60 Minutes as a host. Is that, what do you guys think? Sh shameful. Look at every morning show, English language. Good Morning America, The Today Show, CBS This Morning. Do you see a Latina? Do you see a Latino sitting at the table? No, no. Are we tired of the excuses, people? Ya están cansados? Todos los días, todos los días, lo mismo. So I decided in November 2018, or 2017, and this is where I wanna reach out to all of you. It's grassroots, people. You can't depend on the New York Times to do it all. I watched the Fourth Amendment and I was like, and my husband, and I, he's a TV director, a white guy, of course. <laughs> and we're sitting there, I go, oh my God, ¿Dónde están los Latinos? Where are the Latinos? Where? I see a bunch of white guys. I'm like getting furious. He's like, Rebecca, calm down, calm down. I'm like, I'm just so tired of it. I'm tired of the excuses. Ya estoy cansada, me duelen los huesos. My bones are hurting so much. So here's the thing. This is where I want to teach you guys all. You have the power. You have the power in your hands. You have the power in social media. Now understand, I started in 19... 1981, okay? There was no social media. So back to November 2017, I'm getting upset. I'm, I'm talking to all these journalism organizations. I need a workshop for Latinas. NHJ is, I believe, half or more Latinas. I want a workshop for Latinas. I want this and that. Well, I get he and ha here. And not just only NHJ, we're, we're talking other organizations. Finally, I was like, you know what? I'm not waiting. Yo ya no espero por nadie and I'm not afraid, no tengo miedo. So in November 2017, I thought, what the hell? I started a group on Facebook. Now I already have a successful group on Facebook called Wise Latinas Linked. It has about 10,000 females. Uh, for all you Latinas, you can join it. Sorry, you men, have your friends join. Great resource, you can find everybody. But that group is another one. But in November 2017, I thought, you know what? I'll start Latinas in journalism. Latinas in periodismo, I, should, I, I didn't want to split us up. In two hours, and some of you women are in here, two hours, I had 200 members. Two hours, who were some of the first? Andale, mira, que bonito, I love it. In one week, I had 1,000 Latinas, okay, 1,000. Hablen, I have five minutes? Oh my gosh, that's a long time in TV news. Okay, <laughs> but, that's my background, but, I'm thinking, wow. Y no solamente que hablen inglés, también en español. De España, de Inglaterra, de, de México, all over. The, from Hawaii to Connecticut, from Texas to Minnesota, Latinas everywhere. Today, there's 110 waiting to get in. I vet everyone. Sorry, I needed, I needed to find a group for us so we could talk. And today, I was going to pull it up, but there's some personal stuff going on there right now. I mean, women with, you know, that are asking questions that they need to stay. It's a private group. Sorry, men, once again. Can't join, but 
you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let you in on the conversations. But today, as of today, we've had dozens of women get jobs. Why? Because we don't wait for HR to post it. One Latina leaves and like, hey, I'm leaving, uh, you know, the Philadelphia whatever or the Dallas Morning News or, you know, uh, the Toledo Blade, uh, you know, apply. Isn't that better? We're beating HR. No, ya no vamos a esperar. We will no longer wait. The beauty now is fortunately several people have written about me. So news directors from television, editors contact me, uh, Rebecca. And you know, it's against the law to say, hey, we need a Latina. You know, it is. But on the down low, as the boys club, the white boys club has done for a long time, they ask me, I'm looking for a Latina. I'm looking for maybe someone who's Puerto Rican or whatever. And sure, I'll connect you. I'm not afraid to. So what I'm saying to all of you, I started a group. Now it's close to, what is it, ladies? Who's on there right now? About 2,000, OK? And again, there's 110 waiting to get in. Because yes, to me, it's not about the numbers. It is not about quantity. What, how much time do I got? OK, that's three minutes. <laughs> TV time, that's forever. All right, it's not about quantity. It's about quality, guys. It's about quality. So you can all start your own group. You can start a group of periodistas in, um, you know, I don't know, what's environment, right? ¿Cómo se dice environment en español? Se me... Andale, OK. Cada uno puede encontrar un, un grupo, pero también pueden empezar un grupo. You can start a group, you can join a group, but do something. You all have your own circle of influencers, right? You have your own friends. Start something, make a change. So number one, create change. Stop looking out just for yourself, okay? I could be selfish with my career, my experience, but you know what? When God takes me, and yes, I believe in God, when he takes me, he's gonna go, so, oh, ahí viene Rebecca. Should we open the door? Yeah, open it, why? Because she's gonna start another group in heaven. I will, <laughs> I will. But here's the thing, you guys. You can all start your own group. You can all have your own connections. I don't know how many people, the other group Wise Latinas linked, I have 10,000. I've had everybody approach me, every, you name it, Sears, JC Penny, Target, everybody thinks we have 10 or 15 kids, so they want to advertise. But now, I'm not here to make a buck, you know, I'm here to help. So what I'm saying is today, if you have not affected people, if you have not created change, then what the hell are you existing for? Because if you create change with your journalism, si van a cambiar el mundo, you have to do it as individuals, with the person sitting next to you. With this person sitting next to you. Open doors. You know, we have the glass ceiling, but we have the brick wall. And I've crushed both of them. And also, you know, no disrespect to some of you men, but I hate to say it, reality, there's also a Latino boys club. Sorry, boys, you're going to have to stop that because people like me are gonna penetrate it and we're gonna have all the Latinas do it because it does happen. Sometimes it does. Thank you, I'm glad men are clapping. <laughs> Believe me, I got pictures to show you. So, I'm just going to tell you this. How much time do I have? Yes, se me acabó? Okay, that's not true. You cheated me. Okay, I have one minute. So here's the thing. Create change today. You have the power you don't have to work for the, wait for the Washington Post to come and say, oh yeah, maybe I'll pick you. You create change. Open doors for other people because I really believe what comes around goes around. I'm a success today because of all my Latina sisters, all of them. I mean, if tomorrow, if I wanted a job at a certain place, I'm sure I could get it. But I'm a freelancer now, so I don't have to do that. But, you know, and create change. And if you ever need help, and here's another thing too about these groups. People always reach out to me all the time. And I wrote this on Facebook yesterday, that, you know, you just never know. When someone reaches out to you, stop. Stop, because they may need you, because they need to be talked off the ledge. And I do it all the time. I do it all the time. Stop. You know, you have to be able. Don't be caught up in your news and whatever. Stop. The other day, a woman said, Rebecca, do you have time? I don't even know her. She's in Latinas in journalism. I need to talk to somebody right now. So it's like, okay, call me now. She called me and she said, I don't know what to do because this councilman, he keeps rubbing up against me. And I don't want to tell my bosses because they may take me off my beat or whatever. 
And I thought, and I told her, here's what you need to do. And she followed what I did, and I think it's going to turn out well. But I'm just saying, take a moment to breathe, take a moment to live, and take a moment to create change. Thank you. All right. Do you have any questions? A any questions? Yes. Okay. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to no, cry. No, so Chiona. <laughs> Um, so I'm part of the Latino, the Latinas in media, in journalism, in journalism. Uh, group, and uh, I, I'm 22, I'm very young, and, and I started off very early. I just graduated from my bachelor's degree, um, and I just want to thank you for starting groups like that, and I want to just thank everybody else who came up and spoke, because like being in college and having my Latino friends, it was always a competition. And even at work, it's always a competition for positions. And I've never seen a group of Latinas and even in the space here where everyone wants to help each other. Mm -hmm. And typically they say like, you know, Refinery29 started this thing called R29 Unbothered. And everybody that I was speaking to was like, that can never happen with Latinos because Latinos always put themselves down. They never help each other to get up. And, and this group and seeing all the other groups that people here have, it, it makes me happy. And being Thank young, you. being 22, and just starting in the industry, it, it, it really makes me feel good. So it's not really a question, it's more of a thank you to thank you, you and to everybody else here. Thank you, because you, you need people to have a successful group. Anybody else? Yes. Nice to meet you in person. Thank you. Uh, my question is, what is your criteria for vetting new members for the group? Like I said, there's like a hundred and some get, waiting to get in. There's actually 600 in the other group. Vetting is one, you have to work in a newsroom. I'm also letting in people, you know, which I, I don't know who was talking about it, but, you know, letting in, I see there's independent journalists who starting their own blogs and they have influence. Like I have my own blog and if I write a really good one in, in a day, I could get 4,000 hits. So I'm letting people in like that. I see their LinkedIn. I wanna see that they're really about news. In Espanol or Inglés, lo que sea. I need you to love news. Um, and I respectfully, who I decline, I let them know why. Because I think you can't just decline people. You have to let them know why. And then I push them over to my other group, which is good, you know? But, um, you know, I wish I could open it to all the world. For you people who are, do public relations, open a group, Latinas in PR, Latinas in marketing, Latinas in you know, sport, open it. I mean, I love Facebook, and Facebook tells me I have two of the largest Latina groups. So, you know, I mean, it makes me feel good. And it's free, right? Anybody else? Oh, good. All right, have a good day. De nada. Good afternoon. I'm Raymond Reese. I'm the director and founder of El Gato Media Network, which is a nonprofit that specializes in career development for bilingual looking to break into media. If you don't know what a bilingual is, it's a bilingual millennial. <laughs> I've been doing that for about nine years now, and I've been pretty successful at it. 100% of my students have graduated from college and 90% of the students get jobs in the industry, media or communications after graduation. So today I wanna to talk to you about the barriers that the millennials face when they're trying to enter the industry. Um, when I first started EGMN, I thought I would be doing a lot of inverted pyramid, <laughs> Adobe Creative Suite, uh, video editing, but I soon realized that after working with these students that it takes much more than the technical skills and the portfolio development to transition them from a student to a media professional. <clears throat> There's academic challenges, uh, psychological challenges, and cultural challenges that we have to face. What I wanted to leave you thinking today is that when you're putting together your journalism curriculum or you're putting together a workshop for a conference is that you think about these barriers that they face and incorporate them into your initiative um, because it really will impact them and uh, their career. So the path into the industry is not that, is not that it's difficult. It's pretty clear cut. You get into journalism, you start out in student media, and then you, 
you get your clips, and the clips help you get your internships. And internships, and hopefully you get more than one, uh, you start building a network between student media and your internship. You graduate, and then about three months to a year after you graduate, you land that first job, which uh, you could be getting paid anywhere from 18000 a year to 33000 a year, um, just depending on the market and your position. So it seems pretty clear cut, but that path is very, very convoluted um, for Latino students and bilinials trying to make it into the industry. Like I said, there's academic challenges, cultural challenges, and psychological challenges that they have to overcome. I've had multiple valedictorians come through my organization, smart, smart Latinas, and they cannot figure this process out without some guidance. And it all starts in journalism schools. Journalism schools are failing Latinos. Not all. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Um, and there's some good ones in Florida, California, um, of course, present company included. Uh, but there's few Latino pro professors and, administ and administrators in journalism schools. Um, and it's more than just having somebody in the classroom that you can relate to in a culturally significant way. It's also about having an advocate on campus. So if there's a small group of journal journalism bilinguals that want to start a bilingual publication, they should have a faculty member or administrator as backup you know, to support them. The campus media is often informally English only. Even at colleges that are Hispanic serving institutions, uh, a lot of, there's no place for bilinguals to go to consistently create Spanish language content. There's a lack of student media groups on, on college campuses. Uh, according to the NHJ website, there's like 12 uh, student chapters across the country. There are over 480 communication and journalism programs across the country. There's over 490 college campuses that are Hispanic serving institutions. Right. The curriculum in journalism schools often doesn't include ethnic media, so there's not a course they can take that shows them how to create content uh, for Spanish audiences or how to engage with Span Spanish audiences. And advisors in these, in these journalism schools often don't have a background in the industry. So when they go to these advisors and they want to know what courses should I take for my career, the advisors don't really know much more than what's on that degree template that they tell every other student. Uh, the partnerships, journalism, schools often partner with local media organizations for internships or other developmental uh, programs, and they rarely reach out to the Spanish media outlets. So I knew when I started EGMN that I'd have to fill in the gaps where the journalism schools could not or would not fill um, in regards to bilingual development. But I didn't realize I'd have to deal with imposter syndrome. And at the time, I didn't even know what imposter syndrome was. Um, and, like, and for years, I've been doing, like I said, I've been doing this for nine years now. For the first few years, I really didn't grasp onto this subject. And imposter syndrome is a lack of belief in one's ability or intelligence to acquire success despite evidence of being a high achiever. So these students are gifted and talented. They're my, they're my valedictorians, but yet they, they believe they don't have the skills to compete in the industry. They don't even think that they even belong in the same room as successful journalists. Um, it feels like they're being thrown into the deep end of the pool and can I survive? And if I'm feeling like this now, am I even a journalist? So it results in a lot of our talented media students changing their major because they may change their major to something that's more obtainable. Uh, they're not applying for their scholarships. They're not applying for the competitive internships. They're not going to fellowships or applying for competitive jobs. I'm not even gonna apply for the New York Times. I'm just gonna stay local and stay by the house. Right? A lot, a, imposter syndrome also leads, can lead to depression, anxiety. The students will actively or passively self-sabotage themselves. I'm not going to publish this, this work because I don't think it's good enough. I'm not going to go to the NHJ uh, meeting because I don't think anybody will talk to me. I'm going to miss this deadline. And as much as possible, they may try to stay under the radar. Uh, there's also numerous cultural barriers that bilinials face. Um, one of the one, big ones I've been working with recently are the DACA students. If, uh, if I have a, a year and a half left on my DACA eligibility, but I get offered a three-year contract from a TV station, what do I do? Who do I turn to? Right. And of course, family commitments and responsibilities. We have to work, we gotta go to full-time, part-time, not only to help the family, but to pay for our tuition. Um, we may have to babysit, 
if there's a media, media mixer tonight and grandma comes into town because she's visiting from Mexico, mom and dad expect me to be home visiting grandma and not at the media mixer. Right? <clears throat> and families are involved in every aspect of Bilenio's life. Right? So even if I'm a 28-year-old non-traditional college student um, trying to get into media, I can't just go up and leave and go to the media conference in Miami because the parents want to know why am I doing it, who am I going with, and you know, what is it for? <clears throat> that there's a lot of uh, insecurities around the accent and the language proficiency. So if I'm Mexican American and I and I may want to go into Spanish media, but my Spanish skills aren't really, I don't feel up to par, then I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to stay in English media, even though I really want to do Spanish media, right? And, vi and vice versa. Uh, for, of course, a lot of bilineals are first-generation college students, and so all the host of issues that come with that, the uh, learning how to study, the work-life balance, the e learning e about extracurriculars, and a lot of bilineals bypass the traditional avenue. So even when there is help on campus that they can go to, or a local media association they can reach out for help, instead, they're relying on their mother's fr friends, aunt, who used to produce at Telemundo, um, who may help me to be a New York Times reporter. And so that can be a hit or miss proposition. A lot of millennials are also worried about being pigeonholed. Um, they may love their community, and, but they don't want to be st pigeonholed as the Latino reporter. They want to go into business. They want to be foreign correspondents in the Middle East. You know, so how do, how do I navigate some of that in my, cre in my career um, and my education? So what can we do? There's a lot of, I've, over the years, I've seen a lot of initiatives um, being launched for bilineals and try to get bilineals into the industry. Uh, but please collaborate smartly. It's more than just the technical skills. Uh, collaborate with people who have some idea about the other barriers that bilineals go through. Support bilineal, bilineal student-focused media. Um, there's, there's not a lot, but there is a few. Uh, share their articles. Donate extra equipment. I know there's, they're always in need of cameras, uh, old laptops, tripods, that type of stuff. Uh, donate some time, donate some money. And take a holistic approach to developing um, bilineals. As important as portfolio development is and the tips on how to succeed in an interview and those resume reviews and demo, and demo reel reviews are, again, if we want more Latinos in the media industry, we need to address their psychological barriers, their academic barriers, and their cultural barriers. Rebecca? So, um, when you first started your nonprofit, what was the biggest challenge in the beginning? I mean, how were you able to find the students and go, okay, these guys are the ones that need my guidance? Um, you know, because I've known you for since then, and I think you have done a phenomenal job. You're the perfect person to do this. So thank you for what you've done for the kids in Houston area. But yeah, how did, how did you do that? How do you, do you turn it from a nonprofit and find those people, you know, to your students, and at the same time, maybe your sponsors? This, the students are easy. Uh, we're developed to the point now where the students generally come to us, but it all started with just some flyers. We started a, a bilingual newsletter on campus because, again, there was no outlet for, this, for the bilineals to create content. So we did a newsletter on campus. I put some flyers around uh, campus, the University of Houston, uh, asking for bilingual writers, and I got this massive influx of interest. And then that just kind of sparked that idea of, like, there must be something here. Why is there so many people responding to this flyer? Um, and then I connected with the local uh, media association, the Houston Hispanic uh, Media Professionals, and they're more than ha they're more than happy to help. And I've always I've I've never encountered no nobody not wanting to help uh, the students. It's just everybody's so involved in their own endeavors and their own career that I've kind of had to be that bridge to bridge that gap. Okay, what do you need from me so I can make these programs happen? Any other questions?
journalists help students, you know, that are trying to go on the same career path? How can we reach out besides just reaching out to the university you went to? The, again, it, hopefully there's a uh, publication that caters to the bilennials uh, near you, but I, you could go through the NHJ student groups, um, contact your local university and, and tell them you want to be a mentor. There's various ways. Uh, the students have a hard time of reaching out on their own, again, for a lot, of, a lot of these reasons. And even when they do get a mentor, they don't know what to ask. I mean, they, can't, they don't know what they don't know. And so, and if you're, and they also have to be, I've found it more effective to be taken off of the campus setting. It's something a lot more, uh, less informal. Uh, so we used to have speakers all the time come in and talk to the students at our meetings on campus. And it was great, but I found that the students weren't asking any questions. And then when the speaker would leave, they'd ask me all the questions. And so now what I do is I do tacos with talent. And we go to a taqueria, and I have small groups of about five to seven students, and we, and we have tacos with a professional. And in that setting, both the professional and the student are open up a lot more about a lot of these issues as opposed to in the classroom. Thank you so much, Ray. Gracias. Oh. Mil gracias. So, <laughs> so we have the, our last speaker uh, of the morning and then lunch. Um, we are going to have an hour for lunch. Lunch is where you had breakfast this morning over there in the cafeteria. And then we'll be back here at 2.15 for, um, to resume. Hi, um, I'm Ed Morales. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a theoretical talk. I, uh, <clears throat> I uh, have spent a lot of years as an alternative journalist, and I'm temporarily taking refuge in uh, academia. Um, and uh, I'm really grateful for Graciela to uh, have me come in and talk to you. I talked to one of her classes here, and I had a wonderful time. And um, I want to talk a little bit about Latinx, or Latinx, which is a term that I use in the title of a book that I'm going to publish in September on Verso Press, which is based in London, has an office here in New York. Um, and it's called uh, Latinx, uh, the New Force in American Culture and Politics. And basically, the, uh, the book uh, started really as an examination of the uh, diverse racial uh, component that we have as Latinos, which is not really talked about that much. Um, and then, as the term Latinx became more popular, I decided that I wanted to use it in the title because it reflected how that uh, diversity, that racial diversity that we have, easily transfers to uh, non-binary ideas about uh, sexuality, which is the reason for um, uh, the word Latinx, uh, because it's uh, designed to um, uh, eliminate the designation of uh, male or female uh, uh, adjectives and nouns. So, uh, the talk is called uh, Latinx Futurism, Taking Control of uh, Language and Labels. And uh, the first thing that I say, well, look, in my life I've always been, I've always grappled with defining myself, you know, who am I? Am I uh, Puerto Rican, New Yorkan? You know, actually I published uh, a uh, small piece in uh, the About Us section of Washington Post today, which was about uh, the problem with the, the undercounting of uh, Puerto Rican deaths. And uh, I consciously tried to make it sort of an intersection between Puerto Ricanos uh, de la isla. You see, I do speak Spanish. And me puede preguntar algo en español si quiere. Um, and uh, those of us who were in New York, uh, I wanted to put that kind of intersectional. Actually, uh, Jessica's talk was a really nice prelude to mine in terms of uh, intersecting. So what am I, uh, uh, New Yorican, Latino, New Yorker, Isleño, what race am I, black, white, well not really, both, mixed, macho, feminist ally, cisgender, hetero, gay friendly. It would be nice to avoid being put in a box, but unfortunately, and you know, there's, uh, I have a lot of my students who will say, well, I don't want to be anything, I just want to be a human being, and, and that's a wonderful sentiment, and we all have that sentiment as undergraduates, but... Um, <laughs> but uh, the reality is that uh, the world puts a label on you, so you have a choice, either to accept that label or that stereotype, or um, take control of it, and um, 
and project, what did I say? Redefine it to best suit who you are um, and make it nuanced and diverse as possible. So that's kind of my, my goal in life lately. So uh, what is Latinx? Uh, the X Factor, that's the subtitle of my book, The X Factor in America's uh, Race Debate. I changed it here to identity. Um, Lat Latinx sounds alien but uh, fitting for its allusion to futurism. It represents how we can be the X factor in America's race debate, but it also coincides with a strong push for eliminating identifiers of gender and language. Latinx is more inclusive and represents an evolution towards a future America. So that's why it's futurist, right? That's why there's so much uh, focus about futurism um, among people of color, because it's not necessarily that people of color want to be superheroes, which is the surface idea. It's the idea that people of color want to see a future in which they're more uh, prevalent or perhaps predominant um, in media representation and in all kinds of representation. So uh, we, just for a brief history, I mean, you know about uh, these kind of labels, Latinx. Uh, arises from uh, perceived inadequacies of labels like Hispanic and Latino, which emerged in the civil rights era around the same time uh, as the term negro, or negro as we say in Espanol. And negro has a different meaning, and I talk about that a little bit in my book, but I won't get into it now. Um, to, it gave way to black and African American. Like blackness and indigenousness, Latino has a racial component, to paraphrase. Toni Morrison, Latino, inherited the history of the meaning of color, and this color meant something. So yes, color means something. Uh, the Mestizaje project of Latin America, which many of us have fallen victim to, wants us to believe that color doesn't mean anything. Um, this is just a slide to show you how uh, we can play games with language. Uh, sometimes when we say the word Latina, many of our brothers and sisters in America Latina, this is what they think of Latina, which is where you take a bath. Um, it's actually what my dad used to say. Um, what, what about the iterations of Latina, uh, Latino slash A, more recently attempts to address the male-centric nature of the masculine O. You know, all of the things that we come into contact are masculine and feminine in Spanish. So we have a, a very gendered language experience. ¿Verdad? Como la mesa. Why is la mesa female? Why is uh, la chaqueta female? Why is el pantalón male? Why are los zapatos male? I would have liked to have been there, you know, in Spain and what, in the 13th century when they were making, when they were deciding these things. Um, I might have, you know, had a different idea or maybe proposed that we don't use gender to identify everyday objects, which is something that, you know, in English we escape. So finally we get the uh, Latino slash A and then Latina slash O and then the Latino, which had a brief moment of popularity, which is seized on the internet age to, uh, typo and typography to create a, a shared female, male female space. So we're there like a yin and yang, Latino. But I found that awkward to pronounce. I couldn't get uh, used to it. So Latinx equals inclusion. There's been a mountain resistance to uh, flattening of identity that Latino Hispanic had come to mean for the media. Uh, marketers, uh, uh, no offense, and political strategists. By entering into the gender identity debate, Latinx has a quality of resistance and inclusive character that suggests multiple identities and diversity. So that's really the point of my book too, is the idea of the multi-positionality of Latinos, which I think, again, Jessica alluded to, which is this idea that maybe we carry several different racial and perhaps sexual identities in us. And there's something about Latinx culture because of the large-scale mixed-race experiment that happened in American, uh, Latin America that did not happen in Anglo-America. And I think Jessica alluded to this as well. Hay algo que nos afecta al pensamiento. You don't have to translate that. Um, so the next one, uh, right. Uh, so, you know, and again, no offense to whoever wrote this in New York Times, but Continually, we get in the mainstream area this idea that multiracialism is only about people who intermarry here in this culture in the United States. So we're getting this idea here, which is, you know, I guess positive, which uh, shows uh, a lot of uh, racial intermarriages in advertising now. And you can see that advertising is picking up this idea of uh, 
racial diversity as part of marketing, but there's never any talk about, you know, we are the inventors of the uh, mixed race experience in the Americas, and it never occurs, we're very rarely analyzed in mainstream or other medias, even and in the Latin American media, as, uh, as being mixed race. So let's talk about, and this may be, you know, I'm sorry if this is like overly academic, but Latinx and the in-between space of language. By playing with ideas about language, Latinx expands the meaning of the label to embody progressive change that comes from a new two-sided perspective. So I want to quote here Jeffrey Hurley uh, Mera, who is obviously a multiracial individual or multicultural individual from uh, University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez, who wrote a great piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Latinx crosses the frontiers between languages in ways that are not always accessible in conventional translation. And uh, he, carried Latinx as, uh, he characterized Latinx as being interlingual or located in the space between language, cultures, and identities. So this is kind of a Gloria Anzaldúa idea. Um, the, the great uh, uh, Mexican-American uh, uh, feminist uh, queer writer of the 1990s and who uh, uh, unfortunately passed away was this idea of the, the border space being the space of creativity and energy for Latinx people and the need to, uh, to live more in that space rather than just readapt yourself to a monocultural, monocultural space, which is what many of us unfortunately do in the United States. Um, so what does that mean, thinking in the border space? Uh, Hurley Himera says that in English, Latinx invites, a Latina, I prefer Latinx for some reason, it invites us to rethink the ways that words symbolize difference and can straddle two languages. So in other words, when you hear Latinx in English, you're, you're thinking of, bueno, ¿qué es esta palabra? You know, you, you could see it in English, but you might think about it in Spanish. ¿Qué es esta palabra? ¿Qué, qué, qué diablo es esto? It is an indication to me that there is a movement of culture between Latin America into the United States and, La and, and English speakers are taking that kind of information and creating a word that straddles the two languages. Uh, and so for, for Spanish speakers, it's, it's the obvious person. See, we're already, since we're already bilingual and bicultural, we see already that it speaks to the ethics of gendering nouns, articles, and adjectives. So there's an ethics, hay una ética involucrado en la manera en que comunicamos. When we, uh, when we don't question the fact that language is gendered, it, uh, it helps to create the, the kind of, uh, you know, inequities between gender, you know, which we see played out um, in, uh, in the, the Me Too movement that uh, we have experienced this year. So, uh, and I hope I'm not going on too long. Uh, we want to turn the idea of being American on its head. We can see then that Latinx is a new interlinguistic term that symbolizes the intersection between North and South, Anglo and Latin America, with the South taking the leadership role. Why? Because we have created the word now that Anglo America has to adapt to, because we are creating the space for an understanding of uh, the gendering of language. Rather than just assimilate or acculturate in a side-by-side -side bilingual, bilingualism, Latinx takes leadership in envisioning a new society. So, it's futuristic in that way. So, uh, I'm going to uh, finish up with the last couple of slides. Latinx is futuristic. It's akin to Afrofuturism. And we all know the uh, success of Black Panther movie, right? It's the greatest selling movie of all time. There has been no movie that has been thought of as much as Black Panther. No one even thinks of going to movies as not Black Panther. In which uh, different future visions of people of color and marginalized people are central to narratives and language. In our future, the binaries of race and gender are blurred, and just as the Latin American view of race mixture challenges the racial binary, New views of gender are challenging the binary way we look at gender and sexuality. Latinx is a way for us to show 
how we process those changes. So we can take a leadership role in processing the, the way that society is evolving now. I mean, clearly, this is the way that society is evolving now. It, it's every day in our headlines. And we've talked a lot here about how changing the racial and uh, gender compositions of newsroom is central, es central en este proyecto. Y uh, la cultura donde no, nosotros uh, venimos, de donde nosotros venimos, nos prepara uh, en una manera, uh, uh, well, all right, so I'm losing the words there. In, in a very, <laughs> as you can see, I think in English and I have to translate, unfortunately. So, but, uh, I, you know, we, we have to get over that. I've been, I've been working a long time uh, to avoid this. So here's just a couple of uh, slides, right? This is a post that was used at the Caribbean Cultural uh, and Diaspora Institute where I was on a talk, uh, futurolo Futurology and uh, Latinx Futurism. So the idea here is that Latinx Futurism is more inclusive and not foregrounding black and indigenous roots. And here's another uh, slide, um, which is a mural from uh, Los Angeles, um, which shows the, the sort of indigenous uh, futurist idea. So, nosotros tenemos una oportunidad muy, uh, very special and uh, important here in driving, you know, the idea component of what's going on. You know, I, I think there's a lot of great work being here, being done about structure and organization and participation and diversity, but we cannot lose sight of uh, the idea that we also have an opportunity to change ideas, you know, ways of thinking, orientation. Okay, so uh, I'll stop now, and uh, if you guys have any questions in, in English or Espanol, me pueden preguntar. Yes. Hi, my name is Gypsy. I work for the International Women's Health Coalition. We're a sexual and reproductive health and rights organization. So this is a, a very important development for organizations like mine. And I was wondering if during your research, you know, you made some comparisons as to whether this is strictly a U.S. Latino phenomenon or whether you see that spreading more broadly throughout the Spanish speaking world. And then one little comment that I wanted to make is um, I also speak German and German has a neutral gender, which is das, and babies are neutral. So I thought you'd enjoy that. I'm trying to remember the German that I got from watching Fassbender, but it's escaping me. Um, Alice, that's the word I remember. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, I think that certainly is driven um, in the U.S. I mean, I think it came out of the, the academy. Um, it, it, it came out of a, a sort of a crossover between Latino and ethnic studies and gender studies. But um, I, I think I'm seeing uh, more adoption of it um, in, in Latin America, particular in, in areas uh, that uh, have more contact with the United States. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not here to preach or, or think that this word really should predominate. I'm perfectly happy if a new word comes along. I think that actually that's where we should be going. You know, the idea of identity is that it's always evolving and we should never just stay in the same identity. That's what Stuart Hall kind of said. But um, I, I think that, uh, I think that uh, you'll see it in, in certain progressive sectors and certainly in sectors where our people are concerned with gender equity in Latin America. Yeah. Latinx on it, right? Yeah. So uh, what is a good way to reconcile this conversation with the fact that we also are dealing with a lot of issues of um, machismo mm -hmm. that I think run counter to the use of this word. So I don't know if you could speak a little bit about that. Yeah, well, you know, whenever a group's dominance is challenged, there's complaints about, you know, not being included and happens a lot with Trump, you know, where now there's a big, great victim movement now in the... <clears throat> 
in the kind of white supremacist movement where people talk about uh, being oppressed. And so, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the complaints about, uh, about Latinx, and if you have complaints here, you know, that's fine, let's, let's talk about it, um, come from uh, uh, men who, uh, you know, see things shifting and they want to go back to the traditional, you know, the, the complaint as well, it's not Spanish, and so, you know, then it's not really Latino. But, you know, but I would say that really Latino is moving, it's migrating, it's going to different places, it's living in the spaces, and it's creating. You know, because that's what happened in Latin America. You know, the, it's kind of silly to hold on to a crystallized, you know, uh, version of what, you know, the idea of Latinos, the reason why we're not counted as a race is because we're a mixture of all race. So we cannot be the third race. You know, the idea is that we're you know, we're, we're challenging the, the binary idea about race. But did that answer your question, though, sort of? Yeah. Un placer, entonces. Sí. I have a mic. I'm sorry. I'm going to use my Pero power. Aquí, sí. yeah. uh, just building on that, and then I'll pass it to you real quick. Um, maybe there's a lot of editors in the house, and uh, I, have, I have been fighting with the uh, rejection for using Latinx in news stories because la Real Academia de la Lengua Española no lo reconoce mm -hmm. y por eso no se, no se usa Latinx. Uh -huh. And by the way, we want to see the slide of Latina for us Instagrammers, if you can bring okay. it back to the, because we love it. There we go. How, where is it? Can I do that? There it is. Is that a, is that a big joke in your office? No. Okay. <laughs> Actually, you know, there's a Mexican singer, uh, Jimena Sarañina, who had a, I'm sorry, right? Sarañana, whose father was like a famous Mexican director, right? E e e e that's one of the reasons I, I remember that song that she, but what was her question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> what? Sí. Bueno, es la misma cosa. They, they don't want to recognize, you know, different slang from different countries and it's, it's a way to enforce a, a monocultural idea of race, which is something that really happened in Spain when they suppressed the Basque language and the, and the Catalonian language. And so it's that idea of creating the, the nation state has, has a, demands a certain amount of conformity. And then that conformity a lot of times is about patriarchy, right? So, you know, es una batalla que... Now, if people, you know, I can understand if people don't really think the word is so great. You know, but, but I do think that it's an important moment that symbolizes inclusivity, and that's why I really advocate for its adoption. And I, and I hope that people, you know, begin to adopt it in the uh, editorial uh, process. Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, and uh, I'm a Puerto Rican photojournalist. I'm so happy that you're talking about the resistance to this word, I brought this up with, uh, with Mark Hugo Lopez last year, why we don't use Latinx more until we have a better word to speak to the in-between place. I wanted to ask you about that, the border of place. Uh, I'm finishing my first book. I've been going to every U.S. state, finding our people and asking I'm them. sorry, what's the title again? American Boricua. Oh, cool. Puerto Rican life in the United States. Well, you still let me know about it. Yes, yeah. and I, people have been telling me this for many years, living in this in-between place. Mm -hmm. And how do we as journalists address that, that nuance? Porque no tenemos lado, yeah. somos puertorriqueño, and we have the blood of the world running through our veins. So mm -hmm. to say that it's the year of the Latino again, uh -huh. I mean, por favor, yo no puedo. Yeah. So how do we make this better? Yeah. And, I, and I'm excited that we're mm -hmm. talking about the resistance yeah. to how language sometimes can fail to catch up with, you know, where we are as a culture and a people. Well, great. You know, I wanted to talk about that. Um, I, you know, I certainly, you know, obviously I'm, I'm Puerto Rican. I mean, so um, the, the, the thing about being between really, uh, I think most Puerto Ricans relate to because we have no national sovereignty and we're this unincorporated territory of the U.S. and we're second-class citizens, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that, it kind of starts that way, and, but the, there's a pitfall in, 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 in talking about the border space, and that is that it can sometimes become sort of uh, vague and uh, whatever people want it to be, and so then people talk about ideas like uh, um, strategic uh, essentialism, which is like uh, the idea of uh, how can we create a really strong identity that a lot of people have something in common with. 
Uh, in my book, I talk about how uh, African Americans have openly said that they're happy about the racial binary because it has allowed them to organize um, more effectively because it's clear who they, were, they are. So I think that it's a tough battle and I think maybe we're at the beginning, you know, I mean, uh, I know this is a little bit like Vasconcelos and La Raza Cosmica, the idea of uh, this is the beginning of envisioning our existence a little differently and getting away from binaries. But um, I do think that um, having a strong, what I always say a lot is having a strong uh, feeling about how you identify yourself is really important. And so you have to have that strong feeling, but at the same time be open to the fact that you're always changing. And I know that's kind of a dialectic, but I really think that that's really the best way to resolve the problems because when you get to the nationalist side, then you get, well, I'm excluding all these people because they don't fit in my idea of my identity. And then when you get to the side where, well, I'm just perpetually in this border space, then you don't have everyone, you don't have anything to really grab onto. So it's sort of like you have to, uh, and that's part of the border space. It's like feeling really strong. I, yo soy Boricua, yo soy, yo soy mujer, yo soy uh, periodista. Tengo una identidad muy fuerte en eso, pero a la misma vez, obviamente, yo soy una mezcla de todo. Y por qué, why do we have to be like uh, so binary about everything? You know, why do uh, you know little boys have to do this and that? So, you know, it's 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 a tricky dialectic, but I think it's necessary to engage. And I'm sure I turned off everyone who thinks that I'm being completely too vague. <laughs> That's okay. Gracias. Okay.